a Wikividi Documentaries production. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Enjoy. Bohemian Rhapsody Bohemian Rhapsody is a song by the British rock band Queen. It was written by Freddie Mercury for the band's 1975 album A Night at the Opera. It is a six-minute suite, consisting of several sections without a chorus, an intro, a ballad segment, an operatic passage, a hard rock part and a reflective coda. The song is a more accessible take on the 1970s progressive rock genre. It was reportedly the most expensive single ever made at the time of its release, although the exact cost of production cannot be determined. When it was released as a single, Bohemian Rhapsody became a commercial success, staying at the top of the UK singles chart for nine weeks and selling more than a million copies by the end of January 1976. It reached number one again in 1991 for another five weeks when the same version was re-released following Mercury's death, eventually becoming the UK's third best-selling single of all time. It is also the only song to be the UK Christmas number one twice by the same artist. It topped the charts in several other markets as well, including Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Ireland, and the Netherlands. Later becoming one of the best-selling singles of all time selling over 6 million copies worldwide. In the United States, the song originally peaked at number 9 in 1976. It returned to the chart at number 2 in 1992, and also appeared in the film Wayne's World, which contributed to the revival of its American popularity. Although critical reaction was initially mixed, Bohemian Rhapsody remains one of Queen's most popular songs, and is frequently considered one of the greatest rock songs of all time. The single was accompanied by a promotional video, which many scholars consider groundbreaking. Rolling Stone stated that its influence cannot be overstated, practically inventing the music video seven years before MTV went on the air. The Guardian ranked the music video for Bohemian Rhapsody, number 31 on their list of the 50 key events in rock music history, adding it ensured videos would henceforth be a mandatory tool in the marketing of music. In 2004, Bohemian Rhapsody was inducted into the Grammy Hall of Fame. In 2012, the song topped the list on an ITV nationwide poll in the UK to find the nation's favorite number one over 60 years of music. While Mercury's vocal performance was chosen as the greatest in rock history by readers of Rolling Stone. History and Recording Freddie Mercury wrote Bohemian Rhapsody at his home in London. The song's producer, Roy Thomas Baker, related how Mercury once played the opening ballad section on the piano for him. He played the beginning on the piano, then stopped and said, And this is where the opera section comes in. Then we went out to eat dinner. Guitarist Brian May says the band thought that Mercury's blueprint for the song was intriguing and original, and worthy of work. According to May, much of Queen's material was written in the studio, but this song was all in Freddie's mind before they started. Music scholar Sheila Whiteley suggests that the title draws strongly on contemporary rock ideology, the individualism of the bohemian artist's world, with Rhapsody affirming the romantic ideals of art rock. Commenting on bohemianism, Judith Proino said, Mercury intended this song to be a mock opera, something outside the norm of rock songs. And it does follow a certain operatic logic. Choruses of multi-tracked voices alternate with aria-like solos. The emotions are excessive, the plot confusing. According to Mercury's friend Chris Smith, Mercury first started developing Bohemian Rhapsody in the late 1960s. Mercury used to play parts of songs he was writing at the piano, and one of his pieces, known simply as The Cowboy Song, contain lyrics that ended up in the completed version produced years later, in 1975, specifically, Mama, Just Killed a Man. Recording began on the 24th of August 1975 at Rockfield Studio One near Monmouth, South Wales. After a three-week rehearsal at Penrose Court, near Kington, Herefordshire, during the making of the track, four additional studios were used. According to some band members, Mercury mentally prepared the song beforehand and directed the band throughout. Mercury used a Bechstein concert grand piano, which he played in the promotional video in the UK tour. 
Due to the elaborate nature of the song, it was recorded in various sections. May. Mercury, and drummer Roger Taylor reportedly sang their vocal parts continually for 10 to 12 hours a day. The entire piece took three weeks to record, and in some sections featured 180 separate overdubs. Since the studios of the time only offered 24-track analog tape, it was necessary for the three to overdub themselves many times and, bounce, these down to successive submixes. In the end, eighth-generation tapes were used. The various sections of tape containing the desired submixes had to be spliced. May recalled placing a tape in front of the light and being able to see through it, as the tape had been used so many times. Producer Baker recalls that May's solo was done on only one track, rather than recording multiple tracks. May stated that he wanted to compose a little tune that would be a counterpart to the main melody. I didn't just want to play the melody. The guitarist said that his better material stems from this way of working, in which he thought of the tune before playing it. The fingers tend to be predictable unless being led by the brain. Composition and Analysis Bohemian Rhapsody has been affiliated to the genres of progressive rock slash symphonic rock, hard rock, and progressive pop. The song is highly unusual for a popular single in featuring no chorus. Combining disparate musical styles and containing lyrics which eschew conventional love-based narratives for allusions to murder and nihilism. It consists of sections, beginning with an introduction, then a piano ballad, before a guitar solo leads to an operatic interlude. A hard rock part follows this and it concludes with a coda. The song is in the keys of B major, E major, A major and F major, and is predominantly in meter. This musical format of writing a song as a suite with changes in style, tone and tempo throughout was uncommon in most mainstream pop and rock music, but common in progressive rock. The genre had reached its artistic and commercial zenith between 1970 and 1975 in the music of British bands such as Jethro Tull, Yes, Genesis, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, Gentle Giant, Van der Graaff Generator and Curved Air. The music of progressive rock was characterized by dramatic contrasts, frequent shifts in tempo and in rhythmic character from one section of a composition to the next. Bands from the genre had blended rock with classical music, its structural features and compositional practices, as well as using classical music instrumentation. Queen had embraced progressive rock as one of their many diverse influences. Bohemian Rhapsody parodies many different elements of opera by using bombastic choruses, sarcastic recitative, and distorted Italian operatic phraseology. An embryonic version of this style had already been utilized in Mercury's earlier compositions for the band, My Fairy King, and The March of the Black Queen. Intro, 0 o'clock 049 The song begins with a close five-part harmony a cappella introduction in B major, as evidenced by the presence of AVI Cadence multi-track recordings of Mercury although the video has all four members lip-syncing this part. The lyrics question whether life is real or just fantasy caught in a landslide, before concluding that there can be no escape from reality. After 20 seconds, the grand piano enters. The song modulates briefly to E major and Mercury's voice alternates with the other vocal parts. The narrator introduces himself as just a poor boy, but declares that he needs no sympathy because he is easy come, easy go and then, little high, little low. Chromatic side slipping on, easy come, easy go, highlights the dreamlike atmosphere. The end of this section is marked by the bass entrance, and the cross-handed piano vamp in B. Ballad, 049-240 The piano begins in B major along with the entrance of John Deacon's bass guitar, marking the onset of this section. After it plays twice, Mercury's vocals enter. Over the course of this section, the vocals evolve from a softly sung harmony to an impassioned solo performance by Mercury. The narrator explains to his mother that he has just killed a man with a gun against his head, and in doing so, has thrown his life away. This confessional section, Whiteley comments, is affirmative of the nurturant and life-giving force of the feminine and the need for absolution. In the middle 
of the verse. Taylor's drums enter, and a descending chromatic run leads to a temporary modulation to E major. The narrator makes the second of several invocations to his mama in the new key, continuing the original theme. The narrator explains his regret over Macking, you cry, and urging mama to carry on as if nothing really matters. A brief, descending variation of the piano phrase connects to the second verse. As the ballad proceeds into its second verse, the speaker confesses how ashamed he is by his act of murder. May imitates a bell tree during the line, sends shivers down my spine, by playing the strings of his guitar on the other side of the bridge. The narrator bids the world goodbye announcing he has got to go, and prepares to face the truth. Admitting, I don't want to die, I sometimes wish I'd never been born at all. This is where the guitar solo enters. Guitar Solo, 2.43.05 Towards the end of the ballad section, the band builds in intensity, incorporating a guitar solo played and composed by May. The intensity continues to build. But once the bass line completes its descent establishing modulation to the new key, the entire band cuts out abruptly at 3.03 except for quiet, staccato A major quaver chords on the piano, marking the start of the opera section. Opera, 305-407 A rapid series of rhythmic and harmonic changes introduces a pseudo-operatic midsection, which contains the bulk of the elaborate vocal multi-tracking, depicting the narrator's descent into hell. While the underlying pulse of the song is maintained, the dynamics vary greatly from bar to bar, from only Mercury's voice accompanied by a piano to a multi-voice choir supported by drums, bass, piano, and timpani. The choir effect was created by having May, Mercury, and Taylor repeatedly sing their vocal parts, resulting in 180 separate overdubs. These overdubs were then combined into successive submixes. According to Roger Taylor, the voices of May, Mercury and himself combined created a wide vocal range. Brian could get down quite low, Freddie had a powerful voice through the middle, and I was good at the high stuff. The band wanted to create a wall of sound that starts down and goes all the way up. The band used the bell effect for lyrics, Magnifico, and Let Me Go. Also, on Let Him Go, Taylor singing the top section carries his note on further after the rest of the choir have stopped singing. Lyrical references in this passage include Scaramouche, The Fandango, Galileo Galilei, Figaro, Beelzebub, and Bismillah as rival factions fight over the narrator's soul. The section concludes with a full choral treatment of the lyric, Beelzebub has a devil put aside for me, on a block B major chord. Roger Taylor tops the final chord with a falsetto B in the fifth octave. Using the 24-track technology available at the time, the opera section took about three weeks to finish. Producer Roy Thomas Baker said, every time Freddie came up with another Galileo, I would add another piece of tape to the reel. Baker recalls that they kept wearing out the tape, which meant having to do transfers. Rock, 407-454 The operatic section leads into a rock interlude with a guitar riff written by Mercury. At 4.15, a quadruple-tracked Mercury sings angry lyrics addressed to an unspecified, you, accusing them of betrayal and abuse, and insisting, can't do this to me, baby. Three ascending guitar runs follow. Mercury then plays a similar B run on the piano, as the song builds up to the finale with a retardando. Outro, 454-555 After Mercury plays ascending octaves of notes from the B mixolydian mode, the song then returns to the tempo and form of the introduction, initially in E major, before quickly modulating to C minor only to soon go through an abrupt short series of modulations, bringing it back to C minor again in time for the final, nothing really matters, section. A guitar accompanies the chorus, ooh, ooh yeah, ooh yeah. A double-tracked twin guitar melody is played through an amplifier designed by John Deacon, affectionately nicknamed the DC Amp. Mercury's line, nothing really matters, appears again, Cradled by light piano arpeggios suggesting both resignation and a new sense of freedom in the wide vocal span. 
After the line, nothing really matters, is repeated multiple times. The song finally concludes in the key of E major, but then changes again to F major just before it ends. The final line, any way the wind blows, is followed by the quiet sound of a large tam-tam that finally expels the tension built up throughout the song. Lyrics The New York Times commented that, the song's most distinct feature is the fatalistic lyrics. Mercury refused to explain his composition other than to say it was about relationships. The band is still protective of the song's secret. Brian May supports suggestions that the song contained veiled references to Mercury's personal traumas. He recalls, Freddie was a very complex person, flippant and funny on the surface, but he concealed insecurities and problems in squaring up his life with his childhood. He never explained the lyrics, but I think he put a lot of himself into that song. May, though, says the band had agreed that the core of a lyric was a private issue for the composer. In a BBC Three documentary about the making of Bohemian Rhapsody, Roger Taylor maintains that the true meaning of the song is fairly self-explanatory with just a bit of nonsense in the middle. When the band released a greatest hits cassette in Iran, a leaflet in Persian was included with translation and explanations. In the explanation, Queen states that, Bohemian Rhapsody, is about a young man who has accidentally killed someone and, like Faust, sold his soul to the devil. On the night before his execution, he calls for God saying, Bismillah, and with the help of angels, regains his soul from Shaitan. Despite this, critics, both journalistic and academic, have speculated over the meaning behind the song's lyrics. Some believe the lyrics describe a suicidal murderer haunted by demons or depict events just preceding an execution. The latter explanation points to Albert Camus' novel The Stranger, in which a young man confesses to an impulsive murder and has an epiphany before he is executed, as probable inspiration. Others believe the lyrics were only written to fit with the music, and have no meaning. Kenny Everett quoted Mercury as claiming the lyrics were simply, random rhyming nonsense. Still others interpreted them as Mercury's way of dealing with personal issues. Music scholar Sheila Whiteley observes that Mercury reached a turning point in his personal life in the year he wrote, Bohemian Rhapsody. He had been living with Mary Austin for seven years, but had just embarked on his first love affair with a man. She suggests that the song provides an insight into Mercury's emotional state at the time, living with Mary, and wanting to break away. Others suggest it as veiled reference to coming out, and dealing with the grave repercussions of the sodomy laws of the time. Release When the band wanted to release the single in 1975, various executives suggested to them that, at 5 minutes and 55 seconds, it was too long and would never be a hit. The song was played to other musicians who commented the band had no hope of it ever being played on radio. According to producer Roy Thomas Baker, he and the band bypassed this corporate decision by playing the song for Capital Radio DJ Kenny Everett. We had a reel-to-reel -reel copy, but we told him he could only have it if he promised not to play it. I won't play it, he said, winking. Their plan worked Everett teased his listeners by playing only parts of the song. Audience demand intensified whenever it played the full song on his show 14 times in two days. Hordes of fans attempted to buy the single the following Monday, only to be told by record stores that it had not yet been released. The same weekend, Paul Drew, who ran the RKO stations in the States, heard the track on Everett's show in London. Drew managed to get a copy of the tape and started to play it in the States, which forced the hand of Queen's US label, Elektra. In an interview with Sound on Sound, Baker reflects that, it was a strange situation where radio on both sides of the Atlantic was breaking a record that the record companies said would never get airplay. Eventually the unedited single was released, with, I'm in love with my car, as the B-side. Following Everett's escapade in October 1975, Eric Hall, a well-known record plugger, gave a copy to David Diddy Hamilton to play on his weekday Radio 1 show. Eric stated, Monster, Monster. This could be a hit. The song became the 1975 UK Christmas number one, holding the top position for nine weeks. Bohemian Rhapsody was the first song ever to get to number one in the UK twice with the same version, 
and is also the only single to have been Christmas number one twice with the same version. The second was upon its re-release in 1991 following Mercury's death, staying at number one for five weeks. In the United States, the single was also a success, although to a lesser extent than in the UK. The single, released in December 1975, reached number 9 on the Billboard Hot 100 and was certified gold by the Recording Industry Association of America for sales of 1 million copies. In a retrospective article, Anthony DeCurtis of Rolling Stone explained why the song performed less strongly in the US charts by saying that it's the quintessential example of the kind of thing that doesn't exactly go over well in America. Its chart run of 24 weeks, however, placed it at number 18 on Billboard's year-end chart, higher than some number ones of the year. With the Canadian record-buying public, the single fared better, reaching number one in the RPM National Singles Chart for the week ending the 1st of May 1976. Bohemian Rhapsody was re-released as a double A-side cassette single with The Show Must Go On in January 1992 following the death of Freddie Mercury, with proceeds going to the Magic Johnson Foundation for AIDS Research. The song re-entered the Billboard Hot 100 chart after 16 years, reaching number 2, and spending 17 weeks on the chart, with a year-end chart position of 39. It was certified gold by the RIA a second time on 8 August 2005 for digital download sales over 100,000, and quadruple platinum on 23 April 2014 for combined digital sales and streams. It has sold 4.4 million digital copies in the US. Brought to you by Wikivideo Documentaries. Would you like to know more?